morning and happy Sabbath. We're so excited to have Sabbath School with you again today. Uh, Alicia, Mark, and I will be teaching Sabbath School today. I'm going to ask Mark to begin with prayer. Okay, thank you. Dear Lord, uh, we are excited to be here, and we ask that you be among us as we dig into your word. We learn about healing rest. We learn about how you can empower each of us in our daily lives and learn about you today. Be with each of us and help us to get the most out of it and, and help us to have a wonderful Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we're going to talk about being free to rest. And being free to rest may not always be quite as simple as it sounds. But let's look at our memory verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Now when I look at these, this fear and being afraid in this memory text, it brings comfort. There's a lot of fear in our world right now. We've been through pandemics. Um, we've been through mutations of, of, of the pandemics. We've got more mutations to come. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world, a lot of conflict. And we just see in our lives chaos all around us. But fortunately with God, we don't have to be afraid. We can have, we can cling to him and he can allay our fears. But many people, many of the people who Jesus encountered in his earthly ministry were sick. And we see that. Some of them, even death, I think of Lazarus, who, who he raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. They thronged to Jesus for healing and for rest from their sufferings. And they always received it too. He never turned people away. Sometimes he just spoke a word and they were fully recovered. Sometimes he touched the sick and they were miraculously healed. Sometimes he sent them off and healing took place on their way. Jesus healed men, women, children, Jews, non-Jews, rich, poor. It did, he was no respecter of persons. The worst cases of leprosy and blindness were not from his reach. Indeed, he, he, he even healed those worst sicknesses of all, which were death. This week we're going to look at two very different examples of healing. First one that we're going to look at, the sufferer was so ill that he couldn't even get to Jesus on his own. And this is the story of the paralytic. His friends literally had to carry him to Jesus because he couldn't get there on his own. Jesus was often overwhelmed with crowds needing healing. He'd be jostled, he'd be pushed. People would, would stop him, no matter where he was going, asking for healing. This paralytic symptoms were clearly visible to everyone. So that is the first case where we see someone coming to Jesus for healing. In the other case, though, the symptoms aren't quite so obvious. As we look at the story and this example of Elijah, and Elijah, as we know, is one of the Bible greats. Yet we see that there came a time in his life when he completely lost his footing and needed to be restored. In both cases, the healing came in God's time and in God's way. Although these stories took place in vastly different times and places and under different circumstances, they complement each other. They give us more complete picture of divine healing than if either story we were to study alone. In healing the paralytic, Jesus creates a controversy by declaring the man's sin are forgiven before healing his physical disease. This was an intentional act by Christ. The man's sickness of soul was greater than the affliction of his body. He was suffering under a load of guilt and shame and be because of his past sinful lifestyle. If, if Christ had healed only his body, the healing would have been incomplete. Elijah, though, on the other hand, was committed servant of God. He had faithfully witnessed for Lord, his Lord during the time of Israel's deep apostasy. And we'll, we'll get into this in, 
in quite at length a little bit later. After slaying the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he was exhausted, and under the threats from Jezebel to take his life, he became discouraged. God met him where he was and ministered to his needs. So we're going to learn more about this spiritual lesson as we go on uh, today. As we explore the topic from, of rest, pain, and suffering, we will also contemplate the question that all of us at some point in a, or other in our Christian walk have experienced. What happens when our prayers for healing go unanswered? And we have often wondered why we don't see more miraculous healings. And so today, in the, in the lesson, Free to Rest, we'll discover the answer to this and many more questions about healing. I want to share a quote from Ellen White from Gospel Workers, page 218. God knows the end from the beginning. He is acquainted with the hearts of all men. He reads the very secret soul. He knows whether those for whom prayer is offered would or would not be able to endure the trials that come upon them should they live. And I think this is a really good quote to remember when our prayers aren't being answered. And we've, we've had those. We've seen miraculous healings from God, and yet there are times where our prayers are not answered the way we expect them to. But God knows each individual. He knows each individual heart, and he knows what people can handle and what they can't handle. And so he is always merciful in his decisions. Um, this is going on with gospel workers. This is one reason why, while presenting our petitions <clears throat> with earnestness, we should say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus added these words of submission to the wisdom and will of God in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see here he pleaded, Oh, my Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass from me. And if they were appropriate for him, the Son of God, how much more are they becoming on the lips of infinite and erring mortals? The consistent course is to commit our desires to our all-wise Heavenly Father. And then, in perfect confidence, trust all to him. We know that God hears us if we ask according to his will. But to press our petitions without sub a submissive spirit is not right. Our prayers must take the form, not of command, but of intercession. And so, as we move on, we're going to look at healing rest and Alicia, do you want to talk to us about that? Yes. Uh, so healing rest. Perhaps we are never as much in need of rest as when we are experiencing some melody, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. Often a sickness in one area affects other areas, compounding our problems. Such was the case of the paralytic in the story that we are going to read here. Let's take a look at Mark 2, 1 to 4. And it reads, And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic, who was carried by four men, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. By the time this story took place in Jesus' ministry, Jesus' works and teachings had become well known in the Galilean area, and a throng of people followed him and sought him where he stayed. We can read about this if we go take a look at Matthew 4, 23 to 25. And that says, His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. 
So <clears throat> here was a man unable to come to Jesus on his own. But in faith, he didn't give up, and neither did his friends that carried him to Jesus. The crowd around Jesus was indifferent to the man's predicament. Seeking to satisfy their own desires in seeing Jesus, they offered no help to this man and his friends. In the Desire of Ages, we read that this man had lost all hope of recovery. His disease was a result of a life of sin, and his sufferings were embittered with remorse. He had long before appealed to the Pharisees and doctors, hoping for relief from the mental suffering and the physical pain. But they had coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. This man was entirely helpless, and seeing no prospect of aid, had sunk into despair. Then he heard of these wonderful works of Jesus, and he was told that others as sinful and helpless as he had been healed. Even lepers had been cleansed. The friends who reported these things encouraged him to believe that he too might be cured if he could be carried to Jesus. Yet he remembered how this sickness had been brought on, and he feared that the pure Christ would not tolerate his presence. It was this relief from the burden of sin that he had longed for the most. And if he could just see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, he would be content. So there is much to ponder about the introduction of this story. How many around us are suffering mentally and physically and are longing for relief? How many are burdened by their sins? and their wrongdoings, yet long for the forgiveness and the cleansing that only God can provide. And at what length will we go to bring others to Jesus in spite of obstacles? Are we like the crowd around Jesus that day, indifferent to the needs of the suffering, and instead of showing the way to Jesus, we block the path? So Mark, I'll hand it off to you to Finish the story for us, please. Yeah, thank you. You're going to talk about the root treatment. Root treatment. But actually, I'm going to first talk about how to repair a surfboard. So if you, uh, <laughs> okay. when you get a ding in a surfboard, and kind of using an analogy here, you've got to f cover it right up. Because what happens is, right up right away and fix it on the outside right away. Because, and that's usually hard because you're out in the water usually when a ding occurs. What will happen is water will seep inside. Then if you take it, that, that surfboard, to the shore and you fix it there, what happens is, is that salt water that's inside will start to eat away at the foam. And the foam that's inside the surfboard that's giving it structure. And then it eats away the foam, and then there becomes this space between the foam and the fiberglass, and the fiberglass gives it strength. And when that space is there, if you fix just the outside with that water inside, what will happen is you go back out, and you just have to press on top of the surfboard where that delamination would happen, and you'd get another ding. So you're not really fixing it. You would actually have to f cover it again, and, and then you would get water inside, and then it would go, to go, and on, go on and on. The key to fixing a surfboard is you've got to get all the water out, and if there's delamination, you've got to make sure you fill that gap that's there. So when we go to, and we talked about it, Lisa talked about the paralytic, God was, and we're going to read about it, he was fixing the heart of the matter, the root treatment that was going on. Just like he's fixing that delamination that hurt, uh, happens in that surfboard. So let's go and let's read um, what Jesus did right away as the paralytic was um, dropped down in Mark 2, verses 5. When Jesus saw their faith, this is, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. So in this case, God goes right to the heart of the matter. And, and I, I'll be honest with you. When I read the story the first time, and you would think that, you know, I want to fix the outside. I want to fix his, let, you know, get a, allow him to get up and start walking away. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says, if we read really closely and we're going to go on, he, he fixes exactly what the paralytic needed. That was it. He didn't need anything else at this stage because he saw his faith. He saw his sorrow. Um, I'll also say that at this stage, we know the man was truly sorry. And I think Lisa mentioned this before. But if you noticed, he, came, he didn't come by himself. 
He had four buddies. He had four friends that came to him. These are people that knew his story. These are probably people, and I'm just guessing, that he, he uh, talked about uh, the things he did that he wanted to get better. Um, it was something they knew um, the, the, you know, the predicament that he was in. So I could say that at this stage, after he's been laid down, you knew that this man was truly sorry. So that's all Jesus had to do. Your sins are forgiven. But Jesus had more than just giving that paralytic what he had. He had something for everyone in the crowd. He gave, he had rest and healing for the paralytic, but we had stuff for the scribes. He had stuff for those else in the crowd. And let's read on Rhett, we see on Mark 2, verses 6 through 9, and read what else he had. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when God, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they had reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? I envision that, you know, Jesus was specifically talking to the scribes. He, he, and you see this, he, he felt, he, he heard their doubts in their thoughts. I bet there were others in the crowd that were the same way, not just the scribes. But he gives them exactly what they need. But thinking about this question, you know, how would I answer this question? And if I was, and if I was a dishonest man, okay, and I'm, I don't want to be that way, but I would probably say the easiest way is maybe, maybe just say your sins are forgiven because there's no way I could cure him, okay, from picking up and raising his bed. But actually today, if you think about it, if you have a paralytic, today's medicine may be able to solve his problems, okay? But the only one that can solve his true problem of forgiveness of sins was Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, what was that cost? That cost was a tremendous cost, the cost of Jesus dying on the cross to save our sins. That in itself was the hardest thing that did. And Jesus did the hardest thing. He, saw, he saved his sins. I mean, he, he, he forgave his sins. So let's read on, and let's go to Mark 2, verses 10 through 12. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified, and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. God cured the paralytic. He gave him rest. He cured both the inside and the outside, but he also gave everyone else in that crowd, the, what they needed to realize that he was the Son of Man. That's amazing, and I, I love these stories on that. You know, there are times where we ask for healing. It doesn't come immediately, okay? And I would say also for the paralytic, it didn't come immediately, okay? I think, you know, this was a long, he'd probably been asking for a long time. We saw that, you, you read about that, Lisa, also. Mm -hmm. But regardless of the situation, we can come with our, our needs right away to Jesus, right away to God. And he can assure us through his love and grace that he will take care of us even amid our suffering. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to move from the paralytic, and we're going to go to <clears throat> Tuesday's lesson where we're going to talk about running away. And most of you know who Elijah is. And we know the story. But as a quick review, Elijah lived in a time of great apostasy for the children of Israel. And he, uh, there was, at the time, there was King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who was very, very, very wicked queen. And... Elijah had told, or God had told Elijah to go and see Ahab, and they're going to have the big showdown on Mount Carmel. And what he was going to do was, what he told Ahab, he says, we're going to go up to Mount Carmel, we're going to offer a sacrifice, and we're going to see who really God is. Who is the true God? Is it the gods of Baal, or is it the gods of, of, of Israel? And so they went up on Mount Carmel, and we know that um, 
the prophets of Baal went first, and they prayed, and they cut themselves, and they cried, and, and nothing happened. Elijah even mocked them while he was up there. And then um, it was Elijah's turn. And he took water, he threw it several, several times, took water and poured it over the, the sacrifice, and prayed, and God consumed it. And as soon as, as soon as it was consumed, then the other thing that happened was it rained, and it hadn't rained for seven years. So that's just a little bit of the, 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 the back story, and now we're going to get in to what happened with Elijah. And one of the things that, that we're going to look at a little bit is about some depression time that Elijah went through after this great battle. But I want to talk a little bit about depression, because depression is actually more common than one would think. According to the World Health Organization, depression is a common illness worldwide. More than 322 million people were affected in 2020. 322 million people with depression. Now, there, there is... There are situational types of depression, which I think was more what Elijah was experiencing. And then there's some chemical imbalance kinds of things with depression as well that become a little bit more complicated as, as, um, uh, in, in those kinds of situations. But depression is different from the usual mood fluctuations and short-lived emotional responses to challenges of everyday living, especially when long-lasting, especially when long-lasting, and moderate or severe intensity, depression may become a serious health condition. It can cause the affected person to suffer greatly, function poorly at work, at school, and in the family. At its worst, depression can lead to suicide. An estimated one million people die per year by suicide, or about one person in 10,000 which is about 1.4% of, of all deaths, mm. or a death every 40 seconds, or about 3,000 a day. So suicide is the second leading, leading cause of death in 15 to 29-year-olds. And so you can see that depression mm. can become a very severe illness. But it's, it's interesting because we don't really talk about too much about um, depression in Christianity. And sometimes people be, feel like it's, it's a lack of faith, but, but we can't look at it that way. Most people know that that isn't true. Even Christians, faithful Christians, can at times struggle with depression, especially after a traumatic event. And it's not a sign of lack of faith or trust in God. And we're going to see this with Elijah. Again, one can read the Psalms and see the pain and suffering and anguish that God's faithful people suffered. Sometimes the depression is slowly and quietly takes hold of us, and we recognize it only when it gets really bad. And sometimes it strikes us quickly after a particular draining emotional or physical event. And this is what we see happening with Elijah. He had just been on this huge high. For example, um, with the prophet Elijah, he was completely drained and emotionally and physically wiped out. So in 1 Kings 18, which we just talked about a bit, Elijah had just seen God's miracle of fire coming down from heaven in answer to his prayer, and he had seen the rain come at the end of a three-year drought. I thought it was a seven. It's only a three-year drought that they had. In 1 Kings 19, 1 through 5, we're going to read, And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done. So after this battle on the mountain, Ahab goes back and tells Jezebel um, that ha ha what Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. You think Jezebel was happy about that? Not so much. Then Jezebel sent a me message to Elijah saying, let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. 
So he was given a death sentence. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Now, this is amazing to me because he had just seen God work in miraculous ways. Yeah. But when he had had heard this from Jezebel, and we're going to read a little bit in a, a minute about what Ellen White has to say. But when Jezebel threatened him, he ran. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. Now, if you take a look at how far he went in just a short period of time, it's about as far from here as to San Diego on the Mexican border. Wow, well, that's one. 24 hours. He yeah. Was, he was booking. He was moving. And he was doing this on foot. Uh, under a broom tree, he sat down and prayed that he might die and said, It's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So he was discouraged and de depressed to the point of wanting to die. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. So in the first place, he was exhausted. He had just come off an emotional high, and he'd had no food, and he had traveled a tremendous distance. So Elijah had had a very grueling 24 hours. This experience, coupled with a rude awakening and a death threat, served as depression trigger for him. Also, Elijah was there with the prophets of Baal when they were slaughtered, some even by probably his own hand. And if we look at, back at 1 Kings 18.40, it says, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishron and executed them there. So we see that not, he even, he'd even done battle. Poor Elijah in this short period of time. So you can see why he was pretty traumatically stressed out by what had happened to him. And so he ran. So think about what you do when you get stressed. Do you go and grab something to eat? Do you not eat? Do you sleep? Do you not sleep? Do you look at keeping yourself so busy you can't think about what's going on and just pile more on yourself? Or do you retreat and go into a corner? So we have, we have to think about <clears throat> what we do <clears throat> when we go through these situations and we then help ourselves um, work through it with God. So, of course, um, oh, and there's also medications. Some people self-medicate. And that becomes a real problem that brings about even more, more difficulty. So I'm going to read here. Um, I'm going to take a couple more minutes and read here from uh, what we're going to read from is Prophets and Kings. Because it's what, she has to, what Ellen White has to say about Elijah, I think, is quite interesting. Elijah should not have fled from his post of duty. He should have met the threat of Jezebel with an appeal for protection to the one who had commissioned him to vindicate the honor of Jehovah. He should have told the messenger that the God whom he trusted would protect him against the hatred of the queen. Only a few hours had passed since he had witnessed a wonderful manifestation of divine power, and this should have been assurance that he would not now be forsaken. He had, remain, had he remained where he was, had he made God his refuge and strength, standing steadfast for the truth, he would have been shielded from harm. The Lord would have given him another signal victory by sending the judgments of Jezebel and the impressions made upon the king and the people would be, have wrought a great reformation. So when we're in crisis, we have to depend, if we depend on God, he will continue to work miracles in our life mm -hmm. instead of running. Elijah had expected much from the miracle wrought on Carmel. See, he had hoped that after this display of God's power, Jezebel would have no longer have an influence over the mind of Ahab 
and that there would be speedy reform throughout Israel. All that day, Carmel's height had toiled without food. Yet when he was guided to the chariot of Ahab, to the gates of Jezreel, he was encouraged. His courage was strong, and despite physical strain under which he labored. That's the other thing he did, is he ran down the mountain in front of, of his chariot. So when we're in situations of stress and difficulty, there is only one place to go, and that is to the Lord. Okay. We're going to look now at Wednesday's lesson, Elisa. And too tired to run. Too tired to run. Okay. So this will be uh, expanding a little bit more on what Barb just shared with us. So have you ever felt so tired and overwhelmed that you couldn't pray? And you seem to have lost faith? In today's study, we'll look at examples of Bible giants who felt very much that same way and even acted contrary to what we would expect in persons of great faith. So let's um, look at Elijah's experience. Let's compare and contrast where he demonstrated opposite responses when his faith was tested. So if we go and look in 1 Kings 18, 36 and 37, we read of Elijah's great prayer of faith when facing the opposition from King Ahab, apostate Israel, and the prophets of Baal and Ashereth. And it reads, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So here we see strong faith in God and what he had promised. And we see Elijah giving God the glory for what was about to happen. And then we look a few hours later that evening and we read about quite a different response from Elijah when he was warned of Jezebel's threat. So if we go and read in 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4, we see here, uh, and it reads, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of these by tomorrow this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Um, so, again, you know, Barbara went into the depression here that Elijah was experiencing. And, and certainly the events of the, the past days and, and all that Barbara had covered, um, that had taken their toll on Elijah. He was physically, emotionally, spiritually spent. And we, we read there when he says... I am no better than my father's. He's reflecting on his actions. He recognizes that his weakness and the guilt of that overwhelmed him. In our humanity, we all have felt the ups and downs of life and our spiritual walk. However, it is important to learn how God views these situations and remember his words of encouragement. So regarding this event in Elijah's life and similar situations experienced by all God's people, Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, 
and new faith, new life would spring into being. Um, the few texts from the Bible that bring this further to light, we'll read Psalms 34:18, And that says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Mm. And in Matthew 5, 3, we read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom in heaven. And then in Psalms 73, 26, it reads, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then finally, in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, we read, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we find much encouragement in the Bible for these times when we're in our low, low spots, and we can truly rest on God's promises that he is our strength, and he will sustain us. And now I'll pass to Thursday, yeah, Mark. That's me. Yeah. So uh, thank you on this one. But, you know, we're talking about, and I'll continue on with Elijah here. And I'll have to be honest with you. I mean, I, I kind of see where, he, where his point is, right? I mean, he was up on Mount Carmel. He was, you know, he is a prophet uh, who is the intercessor between the people and God, right? And he showed this awesome example of God's power. And, and you would expect at that point that he was hoping that this must be, if I, I read about this and I see how incredible it is, that the children of Israel would turn, there would be this uprising, and his job would be done. So I can see where he's depressed, you know, that he goes and, of course, Jezebel says, okay, no, I'm going to kill you, and that's completely opposite of what he was hoping for. So I can see where he's depressed. On the other hand, I also have hope. And the hope is, is that, I, someone that's not at the level of Elijah, there are times where, and we, maybe at the Elijah, that when we are depressed, we realize that even the greatest of us have gone into the, you know, hitting that valley. And by looking at this, we can see how he has done to rise himself out. And we're going to dig in that a little bit, a little bit further. What I wanted to say was, you know, on verse 4, he, he was running... He wasn't running with God. But we're going to find out that he was listening to God and his messages. And we're going to keep going on. And I want to read um, 1 Kings verses um, 5 through 8. And we're going to discuss where he's, he's going towards. Okay? So, and Barbara also talked about verse 5. But then he lay and slept. This was after he had said this prayer that he wanted to die under the broom tree. But suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Interesting. So he arose and ate, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Two things why I got to say is, first of all, it must have been a, a, a really big energy bar there, right? 40 days and 40 nights on that food. Second one is, is that uh, the mountain of God, of course, is Mount Sinai, okay? But what we see here in this solution is, in this thing, is that when he woke the first time, he says, uh, the, the angel touched him, or he says, arise and eat. Isaiah listened. I mean, Elijah listened to him. He listened to him. Um, and God was giving him what he needed, was rest. The second time, he woke up, and uh, the angel said, Arise and eat. He listened again. He listened to him. In fact, I will say that um, the angel kind of knew where he was going. I don't think it tells, you know, who, ch who chose him what he's going to do on these 40 days or 40 nights, but he knew he was going to go on some journey. He knew that this is what he needed to, to heal. And Elijah, uh, Elijah was there listening to him. So he goes to Mount Horeb, and he goes to the mountain of God. And what do we, what do we typically do at the mountain of God? Or what do, what do they, not me, but what do they do in the temple of, in the mountain of God? And I would say that at the mountain of God is a time where maybe God talks to us. So let's read about that. 
And, um, and if we go to um, 1 Kings 9 and 10, we'll see what he did. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone have left, and they seek to take my life. So we read about that, and I, I'm going to say right there, what, first of all, God is talking to him at the Mount, uh, mountain of, uh, you know, at, the, at Mount Sinai here. And, and Elijah, while I, I don't think his statement is completely correct, he is pouring out his heart and soul. He's saying how he feels. And if in our depression, in our times we're down, we've got to listen to God, but we, gotta, we also tell him how we feel. Whatever it is, even if that's the truth we have, we know that he wasn't the last. There were other, I think we learned in the, in the before there was a couple other prophets that had been hiding. In addition, God tells us later there was a remnant of people in the children of Israel that never bowed to Baal. And we learn about that. So, so these are things that he didn't know, but for his time, he was pouring his heart out to God. And then let's read, um, uh, continue on to 1 Kings 11 through 14 and say this. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That's where the Lord was. So in, if we go in verse 13, it says, So it was, when Elijah heard this, the small voice, he then wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly the voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then Elijah says the same thing he said before. He pours his heart out for the, for the Lord. And what I read from Elijah in his thing is that he is listening for God. Okay? And the other thing we see about this is that God is letting him do these things. He's guiding him along. He gave him food. He gave him rest. He gave him enough to travel to see him so he can hear him. Okay? And now that, now that he's done all this stuff, we're going to read in 15 and 16 what God has new plans that God has in store for Elijah. And so now that God knew, and we're going to read in verse uh, uh, 19, verse 15, uh, if I said chapter 19, verse 15, then the Lord said to him, go on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria, also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehela, you shall anoint the prophet in your place. God has given him new plans. In fact, he's saying, you're going to have a predecessor, someone that's going to help you. And we learn later that that predecessor, that, that the, the new, not a predecessor, he's going to have someone that he's going to train. And we're going to learn how he, uh, Elisha, Elisha, actually became his servant to help him on this journey. The other thing we find is that if we, we talk ultimately about what happened to Elijah, here he was, verse 4 earlier, he's under the broom tree, desperate, praying to God, why don't you end my life? God never, he never dies. And if we read in 2 Kings chapter 11, let's see what happens to Elijah. And when it happened, as they continued on and talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up, up by a whirlwind into heaven. So he didn't actually, he didn't do that. God had other plans for him, greater plans for them. Okay. In this journey, when we get depressed, what we ask God asks us to do is to listen to him and his messages, and he's going to give us what we need. I think that's okay. definitely good. good. Thank you. Elisa, do you have final thoughts? You know, I, I would just say um, these stories are so inspiring for the time we live in Amen, now. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so much that we see around us going on and we're impacted by and 
small ways and large ways and you know these these stories are such an inspiration for us so um, I guess my final thought is you know cling to the Bible God's Word and cling to those promises because you know that's what gets you through the hard times Amen. Amen. Mom. Yeah. oh yeah so you know I wanted to I wanted to kind of come close with a, a kind of a, a quote that came that I was reading in the study of this lesson from uh, the New Testament in talking about how how we can have the glory of God inside us now and I want to read 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 through 12 and um, let's go ahead and I don't know if you can pull that up and it says here it says we have this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us inside us today even in our even when we're need rest and need healing he has given us that treasure inside our earthly vessels we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are, we are perplexed, yet not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body, that we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, and that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And then I kind of, when I found, paraphrase this, at least for me, is, you know, of course Jesus died for our sins and stuff, but he also died to encourage us and know that we, within ourselves, can do great things. And in those times where we are hurt or despair, we can rely on Jesus to bring us out. Thank you. Um, as I was contemplating my final thoughts, I'm completely changing what I had planned to do, <laughs> what I had planned to say. And I want to, because I want to go back and share with you something that, from Tuesday's lesson that I didn't, did not read. When we are ill and we're going through crisis and trial, oftentimes um, we feel depressed. Why me? Poor me. Um, we really struggle with what's in front of us. And we don't always, we aren't able, always able to see clearly what God has in store for us. Mm -hmm. And so I was, um, Selected Messages, book two, page 242 says, we should daily dedicate ourselves to God and believe he accepts our sacrifice without examining whether we have a degree of feeling that corresponds with our faith. Feeling and faith are as distinct as the East from the West. So we see that, I know when, when we feel bad, it's easy to get wrapped up in, in those emotions, but we have to go, our faith can't be based on our feelings. Faith is not dependent on feeling. We must earnestly cry to God in faith, feeling or no feeling, and then live our prayers. So we go on as if. Our assurance and evidence is God's word. And after we have asked, we must believe without doubting. I praise thee, O God, I praise thee. Thou hast not failed me in the performance of thy word. Thou hast revealed thyself unto me, and I am thine to do thy will. So as we look at the stories of Elijah and the paralytic, we see that God did work all things for their good, and mm -hmm. he does that. He works all things for our good. But we, as human beings, ha can't, can't look at our feelings. We have to look at it, thus saith the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for another lesson. Father, we pray that you, that you will be with us as we walk through our valleys you have promised that you would walk through the valley of the shadow of death with us, mm -hmm. that we need to fear no evil, that you will be our rod and our, our comforter, Lord. So we thank you that we can claim your promises, your word, and that we can testify to your strength and your faith that you give us. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath.